Hello and welcome to what has become an annual event. After Crash Live, I did another interview with Chris Wilkins. This year we didn't just talk about Crash Live, we talked about the year that he's had and his plans for the future. If you wait until the end, there's some really interesting information about what Chris has planned to do in the future, so I'd encourage everyone to listen to that. So on with the interview. Chris, we talked a year ago, even though I don't think you can remember that after Crash Live. I still don't I don't I still don't believe you, Jeff. <laughs> even though I've shown you the evidence. Even though I've listened to the evidence, I still don't believe you. Yeah. It's a bit of a blur. Well, and I think from afar, it looks like you've had a really, really busy year. I think uh, the end of last year and then all of 2023 looks like it's been really busy for you. But So it would be good to talk about that rather than just concentrating on Crash Live, which has just gone. If we talk a bit about your year, I think that would be good. And from memory, I think this time last year, Ollie had passed away, but Roger was still with us. Is that right? Yeah, so, so Ollie, Ollie passed away in the summer the previous summer so yeah we we had i'll remember it all ollie's funeral was the the 22nd of september hmm. which i'll always remember because that's my birthday and then rog rog obviously was at the funeral of ollie wasn't very well latest later stages of mnd so this time last year I was going over to see Rog every every Thursday. You know, I, I think I appreciated the last six months or so last year that I wouldn't have that opportunity yeah. much longer. So I just wanted to make the most of it. I think I've said before, I used to go over on a Thursday and he had a, a clock uh, in the in the foyer, which I've, I've now proudly have on my wall in my study, where it's one of those really old ones. You had to wind up. You had two keys, one one for the mechanic for the for the clock and the other one for the, the kind of ding dong, ding dong bit. The chime. Yeah. So so Rog, bless him, went you know, towards the end of his illness, his mobility had, had completely gone. So he, he couldn't lift his arms, he couldn't turn to look at the clock. So he would he would gauge what time it was or know what time it was purely by by the chimes yeah it, it would do that kind of ding dong ding dong every quarter of an hour and and then chime on the hour so so i used to go over every thursday wind the clock up for him and then we would we would just talk and talk yeah. you know about the old days and um and what was happening in in the world of of crash and zap and all the other things we were doing but he started christmas early last year because because he knew you know he knew that was going to be his last christmas unfortunately so you know the tree was up very early on in December, and the um, hotel chocolate that I used to get for all the friends and family and such were out. So yeah, go, going over there in December last year, it was it was very Christmassy, very early on, and he was trying to make the most of it really. Yeah, this was through that month. Yeah, so in the in the same kind of parallel world I was in we had if you remember Royal Mail decided to strike all the way through parts of November and December so so I had all that to contend with as well in in terms of sending out all the the annuals so it was, it was a bit of a crazy time so when we broke up for Christmas and we, and we went down to Wales which which we do every year I don't know if many people knew I was power of attorney for Rog and I was in contact quite a lot with the people who were caring for him so Christmas day came and went and I had the shock during that period of time that another good friend of mine Archer had died Archer McLean and then I got a phone call just before New Year's Eve I think it was 28th 29th to to say Rog wanted to to go into end of life so when being power of attorney we, we had to have a conversation that we all agreed that Rog was of sound mind and he was because uh, that's what MND does to you. He takes everything else away from you, apart from your mind, and and and, and that was that. You know, that, that's that's just about just over a year ago. That's been since Crash Live last year, then. Yeah. So so Crash. I can't even remember the dates, Jeff. Crash Live last year was November the eighteenth, something like that. Yeah, it was the it was the eighteenth this year. So it, it might have been thereabouts. So we celebrated. If you remember, we had Anthony and Nicola showing some of the the movie there in the evening and there was clips of Ollie and Rog that hadn't been seen before. So they, they were there at the event, weirdly, uh, with us. And it was kind of kind of 
kind of poignant and a little bit emotional just seeing them on the big screen, you know, mm. from recordings which took place from memory around 2014, 15. So, but both with us, both well, and had yeah. no inkling what the future held at that point. Our a mutual friend, Wayne Robbins, Retro Robbins, said to me that the the legacy, their legacy of Crash is in really good hands. How do you feel having that legacy, that very, very heavy legacy to contend with? I, I guess with, with with Crash and Zap and what we've done, we, we, we sort of started the journey with Rog and Ollie, you know, doing the artwork and Rog at the helm. Yeah. So I guess, you know, I always say Rog taught me pretty much everything I know about publishing, about, you know, black is not black and how to use InDesign and all that kind of stuff. So I think the teaching that he gave me put me in in a good place, really, to, to carry on what we all started together, carrying the torch or whatever you want to say in regards to Newsfield and Rog and Ollie. The, the, I mean, Rog. Rog was the person I was close to. Rog is the one I really miss. I mean, I got to know Rog first and then not really appreciating Ollie was his partner. So so Ollie became a good friend, but it was it was Rog that was sort of my mentor really and the person I would talk to daily, you know, on, on Slack and chat and, and ring in. So I said so so feeling the pressure on my shoulders, like I guess I, I don't f- feel it per se but I, I sort of it, it would it would be nice at times to go on to slack and say hey rog you know i've got a problem what do you think i should do but you all you always sort of think back about the things he would have told you you know you the things he would have how he would have answered that question so i think as the anniversaries come and go you sort of reflect and you look back at images and such and you you sort of always they're, they're always sort of with you kind of thing i can i can hear ollie you know ollie's voice in my head you know um hi chris you know in, in his kind of high-pitched kind of little voice and and rog being the calm one you know well spoken so i can hear their voices and they're sort of directing me as i meander through this kind of journey i'm on with publishing I, i'm not sure if i've answered the question I, I don't i don't i try not to think about it really i just carry on the good training i guess they gave me during the the many many years i knew them yeah, I think from what you said, Chris, I think I'd sum it up as you feel like they're living on with you in spirit, especially Roger. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I still go back to Ludlow, still got friends there who, I've, who I met through, through through knowing Roger and Ollie. It's really funny because w- w- when I was a kid, being back in West Wales, Ludlow was this place, you know, in a foreign land somewhere with a massive castle where they produced Crash. And, and now it's a place I can frequent and know the streets and, and places I used to walk around, you know, with Roger and Ollie when they were with us. Yeah, they're still with me in spirit. And those spirits are helping you carry that legacy? I think it's been such a busy year. I mean, it was a bit of a crazy beginning of the year. I think with, with Roger's funeral at the end, end of January, Archer's funeral as well. I went to Archer's funeral. I can't remember which way around it was now. I went to Archer's funeral one day and then it was Roger's funeral the next day. And then mix that all that up with struggles with uh, Royal Mail and, and issues. It was, it was a bit of a crazy time. And, and, then, and in amongst all that, me and you spoke <laughs> about yeah. uh, Crash Live last year. I, I honestly can't remember it. So it was, it was a bit of a crazy time. I think we spoke quite soon after Crash Live from memory. Moving on, again, your, your publishing business continues. And it, it feels like you've published quite a few books this year. Are there any that stand out? Preferably ones that are Spectrum related. I, I take the dog for a walk every day. That's my escape. We've got Rex, our, our border collie. So when I started Fusion Retro Books full time, when I hit the magic fifty, I walked away from my day job, started the company full time. We launched, you know, Crash and Zap, and in amongst all of that, we got a little puppy. Yeah, a little puppy collie, border collie. So taking him down the woods in Kenilworth uh, daily, and that's where I do a lot of my thinking. I, I, I had a thought about doing a book to celebrate Ollie's art. You know, why don't we do a book to look at the covers of Crash 1 to 50 or 1 to 100? And I spoke to Nick Roberts about this. Nick does the play tips in Crash and obviously was a big part of Newsfield back in the day and friends with Roger and Ollie. And he reminded me that I think it was from Crash 44 odd to 48, Roger in the guise of Lloyd Mangrum looked back on what Crash had achieved and what Newsfield had achieved at that point. So the idea came then, with the help of Nick, was would be to 
create the crash legacy which is lifting the text from those magazines and using a very talented guy gary arnott on his magical skills with photoshop we were, we were able to basically create digital versions of all the artwork without any of the strap lines that were missing because when i inherited the the art from ollie and rog when i bought the rights for that like the summer before I think there must have been about maybe 30 or digital versions of the covers without the strap lights. So Gary, and I have no idea how he does this, but we'll take a very good scan of the cover and then take the crash logo away and any of the text and any of the graphics over the cover and, and basically replicate what, or maybe not even replicate in some cases, come up with what you thought all he would have had behind those images. And in many cases, Ollie wouldn't have had nothing on, on the art because he would have known there would have been an image there on the final version of the cover. We, we started the ball rolling with Gary. Um, I think it was issue five of Zap, that cover. And we, we showed Rog and Ollie and all, all, Ollie loved what we had, what Gary had done and signed it off. So we knew we had a bit of a star in Gary. And with Ollie, before he passed away, endorsing Gary's talents, we knew that artwork was in safe hands. So we created the Crash Legacy book, really. And it, it was looking back again with, with Rog and in the guise of Lloyd Mangrum on each issue of Crash, celebrating the cover. And what we did was, instead of the, having the cover there with all the strap lines, we just showed the raw art that Ollie did. And it was a celebration, really, of what Ollie had provided to, to Crash as well. And then we included a couple of articles in there, then what we, what Rog and Ollie and I had done for Crash 2018 annual, you know, how, how a, an issue of Crash went from, from start to end. And then we, we just put tweaks here and there in terms of screenshots of some of the games and such and put it in a nice blue binder, not a, not a binder, a slipcase. For me, that's the highlight of what we, that, that was our main product this year, because when it came back, it, it, was, it felt like a really nice product. And flicking through the pages, it's just gorgeous to see all the, the, all the art, you know, and I, and I still do it now, just flicking through and just seeing the art of issue one to 50. So, so, we, so that just came from an idea, walking the dog. And then talking to Nick and that, that, that product came out quite quickly. That's the proud, that's one of the most proud products we've released this year. We also published Jedix Nightmares, which is a book that Graham Mason uh, had, the, had the idea for for, for for a long time. But we managed to pull that together with the, the help of Steve Day, who did the, the layout for Crash Legacy. He did the layout for Graham's book as well. And that, that was really well received. It's sort of all those games that were that, that for whatever reason were a nightmare on the spectrum, you know, games that were difficult. Why on earth did they do these kind of games? That it's so diff different sections of the book. For example, Airwolf by Elite, you know, it's a it's, it's a good game, but but fiendishly hard, yeah. So so that came out and did that did well. I have both of those books and love them both. Crash Legacy in particular, it's a superb book. When I was 13 or so, I, I had Crash for for a while, but by the time issue 44 came along, I was well gone. I was, I think I was probably in uni or something then. So, so I, I didn't realise those were there. And then reading those for the first time as I was proofing and editing and making sure the OCR software we were using was doing things correctly, it was it was very poignant knowing Rog and Ollie had gone. And then, but reading Roger's words for the first time and then reflecting on the, the early years of Crash and Newsfield. So it's quite a powerful read now as, as, as time has moved on. It's, it's a very moving, powerful read. I think because Roger was looking back, it's almost timeless. He could have written them a year ago versus 30 years ago. Yeah, definitely. It, it's the same thing, isn't it? It's, it captures his memories of how issue one of Crash came about and how things had very much changed in, in the dynamics of the company by the time issue, I think, 48 came along, which is four years, four years later. And I like that he talked about the artwork in every one as well. I was really surprised that Ollie hated doing Jack the Nipper. I said that at the live show. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's certain covers that Ollie detested. Another one that was Max Headroom as well. There was, there was covers that he always used to curse and swear at whenever they were mentioned. The Jack the Nip was such a good one. It's, it's it even, again, I said this in the live show, it's even more impressive because he hated it. Yeah, I guess the ones that you hate sometimes are the ones that everybody else love. So the Zedek Nightmares one was, it's kind of lighthearted fun, really. It's, 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 it's a nice book to flick through and just read some of Graham's very clever writing on some of the games we all know and love or hate. 
it is written really well. Those were both Kickstarters, weren't they? The Crash Legacy one was done on my site, which is which is like a very 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 similar to a Kickstarter type module. It took Zelix Nightmares to Kickstarter, and then later on, then we we created Craig's book, Game Not Over, which was about not necessarily Specky, but but you know lots of other systems out there that were very niche, originated from many faraway countries that you may never you know come across as a gamer, like the Dragon Thirty Two. Don't think that was in there. But that, that was a very popular, popular machine, wasn't it? Can't remember. I, I ne- I've never seen uh, Dragon Thirty Two. I don't think I've ever put my hands on. I'd love to. It's the Oric as well. I would, I would love to try one of those, but it's just something I've never had a chance to do. See, the Dragon Thirty Two is a nice machine. It's very well built. Got a lovely keyboard, but I don't think it was. I don't know too much about it. But it's not, not the most powerful of systems. You know, if, if you can't display things in color, but it, it was good for adventure games, wasn't it? So I, I recall. I would think so, but I, I remember the Dragon software section. I think it must have had a Z eighty because there were a lot of kind of similar games to the Spectrum. There are a lot of clones from the Spectrum. I think I just remember having it and and an Auric actually because these these systems I managed to get them from somewhere and you play them for a little bit and you get the SD solutions and then you you probably realise you haven't got that emotional retro nostalgic relationship with them and and then you know they either go in the shelf up the attic or or, or, you, or you sort of move them on. So there was there was Game Not Over by Craig Turner that was another one we did we did a reprint of and this is a mouthful, and I always get it wrong, the game of the film of the... See, I always, I've always, i always got to look it up. It was Jerry Ellis's book on, on, on those titles that were games based on movies and such. So we did a reprint of that, and that just went out before the Christmas rush took place. And then more recently, now we've done the annuals. We did four annuals this year, Crash, Zap, Toy Ploy, and Fusion. And here we are now, the end of the surge of getting, you know, nearly a couple of thousand orders of those out. So that that was that was that in terms of books. Uh, we've obviously got the magazines which have been ticking along: Fusion, Crash, Zap, and Amtix. And we've just launched a new Sega magazine, which we've also called called Sega Force, which is sort of nodding back to the Sega Force magazine that obviously Rog and Holly and the gang did back in the day with Newsfield. So that's literally just come out. So there was all of that, and then we created the digital membership section on the site so people can join up and have access to all of the back PDFs of all the, the magazines and the books online as flip books or downloads, and we did all that as well at some point, maybe six months ago. And we got lots of other ideas. I mean, did I, did I miss anything, Jeff? Did, did, did we do anything else, which I've forgotten? I think that covers everything. Yeah, I think that covers everything. That was a lot, though. As I say, looking from afar, it feels like you're doing so much more this year than you were, say, 18 months ago. Yeah, so so Al- Alan Hamilton, who's part of the team, he tends to do a bit of a roundup on social media of what, what we've done during the year. So at some point between now and Christmas, I'm sure he'll do that. And it's quite staggering, really, how many words, pages, you know, publications we do. But there's teams across, literally across the world now looking after at least each of the magazines. And they, 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 they just come out on, on, on like a treadmill now, you know, or assembly, li- assembly line. So I, I'm, I'm the last point of contact where, you know, I give it a once over and then, and then I send it to print. There's, there's a kind of a routine, you know, that, that's in place now that, that we follow each month. But yeah, it's it's kind of quite staggering. I'm I'm on my website now, just flicking through, just reminding myself what we've done really, and, and it's it's still quite a lot. Yeah, a huge a huge amount. Maybe you'll have to stop taking your border collie for walks and getting ideas for giving yourself even more work. It, it's crazy. I have so many ideas, and and we've got to phase them. You know, there's 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 ideas for books that we're doing next year. We're looking at the idea of doing a book on on maps, for example, because we've got Gary, who's obviously the whiz with Photoshop. We can we can scan the maps in in all the newsfield publications and and create a book on 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 just the maps, you know, of those games. And then Graham's doing a follow up called. ZX Dreams, which is, is basically looking at all the games that we all remember fondly and love, and and that's more difficult to produce because there was just so many of them against all the ones we tended to hate for all the wrong reasons, you know. So I've said to Graham, it's got to be the same size, and it's all those games that you know <laughs> he goes to bed with a smile on his face dreaming of. 
we, we're doing a graph gold book as well which is which is which is in full flow now with steve turner and andrew braybrook and a few others so we will be looking back on all those spectrum classics that steve turner coded i think i'm known to many people andrew had had a say in some of those games as well and steve helped andrew with some of his games well, I'm sure the projects will come out, literally come out of the woodwork in the woods as, as we're down, as I'm down there thinking, OK, what next? Yeah, I, I saw Steve at Crash Live and I apologised to him because I put out a video of games I didn't get on with and Avalon was one of them. And he was so nice about it. He's such a nice guy, isn't he? Uh, him, him and Andrew, very humble. They, they, they both came to Zap and then I said, do you want to come to Crash? And they said, even before I finished, yep, yeah, we'll be there. So I think they're a part of the, the fabric now of these events. I hang off every word they talk about because these games were the ones you know that I played when I first had my specy Avalon, you know, Cyber Attack, Space Wars, you know. There's, and then and then later on I was playing Fire and Ice, you know, on the Amiga. We had Jason Page who did the music at the Zap event, you know, for, for that game. So Graph Gold, big big part, just just like Ocean and Houston and all these other big ones, big part of my childhood. So you mentioned live events. Let's come on to live events. As this is the Spectrum show, we'll touch on Zap Live, but only briefly. Tell us a little bit about Zap Live, Chris. Not too much. <laughs> okay, so we we did we did Crash Live last November, and we did that at Bescott Stadium. We we had to move from there. We looked at the Holiday Inn in Kenilworth. I'm from Kenilworth. I've lived here thirty odd years. Got married in that hotel. It was called the De Montfort Hotel back then. So I went back there thinking, could this hotel be a contender for a venue? They had done quite a lot of rework on the hotel post the pandemic. They, they'd had extra rooms and ex- different layouts on the ground floor. And just, just walking around there pre-Zap in August, thinking this, this could work, yeah? This could, we could have that there and we could have this and the Amiga section there. We took a punt. Craig Turner was still, you know, he was a part of the whole process on, on helping me choose the venue. And we, and we did Zap Live, which was basically a Commodore version of Crash Life. Lots of VIP guests for this one. They, they they just seemed to come out of the woodwork. I think I counted over 20 recognisable legends that came to, to Zap. We had an Amiga area. I mean, I moved on from the Speccy to the Amiga, so that was kind of close to my heart. And then we had a big section. Obviously, the main room was, was all Commodore 64, Big 20 kind of related. And we we used the small room there, the smaller room there as a Q&A area. We, we, we could fit about 100 people in. And I was thinking, if anybody's going to complain about anything with this venue, it's it's the size of the Q&A area. And, you know, we, we did the talks. We had the likes of Jeff Minter from Lam, Lamasoft and, and Giles. We had Andrew Braybrook. We had other talks there. And it was actually Ram Jeff. It, it, you know, people were sitting down. And in many cases, many didn't leave between each Q&A. They just wanted, they were just so keen to hear what these guests had to say. The doors were open, people hanging in, and there was a crowd outside. And, and it was a bit bonkers, really. So, you know, you do a new venue and you learn from the mistakes. And, and that's what we did, really. It was, a, it was a really successful event, Zap Life, really successful. We thought, okay, this venue is actually brilliant for what we're trying to do, but there was lessons learned. So we applied all those in Crash Live, which took place 18th of November, weekend um, just gone. The second big room that we were using at Zap, for, which we called the Commodore Amiga room, we made that the Q&A room. It meant we could fit in a stage, which was another complaint about the Q&As before. People at the back couldn't see the guests, put a stage in there, the PA system, we could fit in there around 150, 160 people. So we did, we did that. The likes of Steve Turner, Andrew Braybrook, uh, Ian Oliver as well that we had there from real time. We did Star Strike. We had them on, on a stage. Everybody, everybody could see them. We got everybody in, closed the doors. The sound system, uh, I believe, was really good. It was the same sound system, but the room really worked with the sound system. I recognised, I think, the talks are a huge attraction to these events we're doing. I think I proved that point in my head was when we did the next talk and we were just finishing off the Artec talk before with Charles Cecil and Tony Warner. Even though the room had 150 odd people, it was full. I don't know if you saw this, but a queue was starting to form outside for the, the Spectrum Next Q&A, which went all the way down the foyer, down into the next room. So on, on the fly, we just I just decided and agreed with the guy to do two Spectrum Next Q&As because there would be another, otherwise quite a lot of disappointment people but it just summed up the excitement really that the spectrum next which is a big part of crash live 
it has captured the imagination of so many people, especially at the Crash Live event. We had a white Spectrum Next as a raffle prize, and we were able to give out a kickstart to black Spectrum Next to, as a raffle to, to one of the early bird ticket buyers. Not everybody would have seen this, maybe the, the food, the price of food. We did quite a cost-effective menu this time, something that didn't happen at Zap. And we did the layouts a little bit different. The, the room that we used at Zap for the Q&A, we, we turned into an arcade. So we had many of Archie McLean's arcade machines there, which are now used and, and displayed at the Arcade Archive Museum down in Stroud which is part of the Retro Collective with Alex and Holly. And Neil Thomas came along as well, and he he's he will soon release a video of, of how we created the event from scratch until teardown. And then we had, say, lots of guests. We had the Oliver Twins, who have been friends of mine for many years, pop in. I think I've mentioned Ian Oliver, Steve Turner, Andrew Braybrook. Your good selves, you did a live Spectrum show again as a follow, follow on to the one you did last year. So, you know, I, I think the whole ambience and atmosphere that we created for, for this Crash Life, and from what I've heard from many of those who attended, that we continually step up. Each one is better than the one that's happened before. The venue got very excited at how many people turned up for Crash Live, and they keep asking when's the next thing we're doing at the hotel. And all the traders there did very, very well. I asked Clive if he, if he would sign some posters and he brought his new saboteur game for the next along in a duffel sack. And I think that queue formed around him for about an hour and a half, I was told, you know, where he was just selling his games, signing posters, signing games. There was quite a lot of good memorable moments from that event. And I'm already looking forward to the next one. And that's nearly, what, 11 months away? <laughs> yeah, the sooner it comes around, the better from my point of view. I've, I've got to ask Chris, do you want Paul and I back next year? Well, do you want to come back next year? Do you enjoy these the pressure of these live events where things could go wrong or right or the awkward questions? Of course I want you back, yeah. Paul and I both thought that it went better this year than last year. We didn't have we had a few hiccups last year, and we think it flowed much better. So I think, as you said, you learn from what you've done before. So I think we learned from last year for this year's, and I'm sure we'll learn some more lessons for next year's. In fact, I've already started thinking of ideas for next year's and sending them to Paul. Yeah, well, yeah, same here. I think I think the stage and the, the PA system worked a lot better. The setup in this event. Going back to the last Crash Live event we did in Warsaw, we had to sort of create that kind of pretend Q&A room, didn't we, with soundproofing. There was no ceiling. The sound just, you know, went off into the distance. And Oh, yeah, definitely, mate. You're, you're a part. You're, you're a part. I, I love your show, as you know. I think I was the one that said to you, I need to come back on. It's been two years. And then you said, no, it hasn't. It's only been 11 months. No, it hasn't. So, uh, yeah, please, if, if you would. I think everybody loves your live shows. And again, the room was full for your show as well, wasn't it? It was. I do remember, I think, every single talk, there were definitely hangers on at the door as well. I don't know if there were for Spectrum Show Live, but there definitely were for all the other ones because it was a good event and really nice to be to. I think last Last year, as you said, you look around and you could feel the love in the room. I think it was the same again this year. Yeah, I, th I think I uh, think I, I felt that when you know the, the the venue is the venue, yeah. So you, you've got rooms and you've got areas. I mean, we had Anstream as well in the in the reception area next to the bar, who were doing like specky competitions for the day. So I thought logically, I know when we do the raffle, we, we'll we'll do the draw there, you know, by that area because it's like a big space. Then you realise when 500 people cram into that space, where everybody is hoping they've won the white spectrum next. It was incredible. I was right in the middle there and you could just see everybody and you could just feel the vibe, you know? And everyone hoping to win the White Spectrum next. I spent quite a lot of money on raffle tickets. Sorry. I didn't get it. <laughs> no, it's okay. I mean, some of it went to charity, which is always a plus. You can always think, well, I've done something good, even if I didn't win. M&D Association is a charity that we've supported, obviously, with the links to Rog. They were very good to Rog. I think from the last time I remember, there's about seven grand that we've donated through the company now in, into that charity. And that's the one we've picked. You know, I know, I know uh, there's others, but that's the one I agreed with Rog, we would keep on going. But but yeah, that, that moment where you've got a microphone, there's about a foot of space around you, you know, with a table. And Laura, one of my daughter's friends, was selling the raffle tickets. And then there's a sea of people all the way. I remember Adrian Sinclair, every time I was shouting at the ticket number, he was he was re-shouting it out. Do you remember? Yeah, further down. For some of the prizes, you pulled out tickets and people weren't there and lost out, unfortunately. A very, that did happen at the last event. This time it didn't happen so much. I think this time we 
we publicised what we were going to do and everybody knew what we were going to do. So that's why there was so many people there. And we didn't have so many prizes this time. At Zap, we had an endless supply of prizes, which went on forever. Uh, but this one, we had some high high value prizes. We had an arcade machine, which was the second prize. And the third prize was a chunk of books. And the fourth prize was some gifts given to us by a numbskull the guys who do some get the, the little arcade machines and, and obviously the, the the spectrum next i mean i have no idea what the value of that would be it's just priceless at the moment isn't it with the the excitement around the next and a white one which which is one of only a few and it seemed it seemed to go to a good person as well who you know who, who really appreciated owning it and wouldn't be the kind of person who would try and flip it you know onto ebay or something so no i think i think that was a good thing i think wasn't it someone associated with the spectrum next or they they've been doing some program for it? i can't remember who it was unfortunately no not me it wasn't somebody I knew, but I, I, I did I, I did see videos of him taking it apart after he got it, but that was quite funny. <laughs> it did go to, it, it went to a good home. It was obvious it went to a good home, which was really good. Yeah, it did, yeah, which was really pleasing. I mean, I mean, any home would have been good, but he, you know, it, I just remember saying to him, you know, are you going to say a few words? And he was trembling. He, he, he was so in the moment, you know. It was really nice. It meant so much, you know. Some of the things that we're doing mean so much to people. So I was pleased on his behalf. Yeah, and it's nice that he didn't flip it. I think I've seen Next Issue 2 is going for about close to £1,000 on eBay. People posted it on Facebook. Yeah. And God knows what that would go for if you put it on. We'll never know. We'll never know, Jeff. We'll never know. Now, I know last year you had a load of difficulties with Warsaw getting through to the FA Cup and getting a home draw. Were there any this year? Hopefully it went smoother. The, the hotel had been brilliant. So the staff at Zap didn't quite know what the hell we were going to do. So we tried to explain it to them and we showed them a little video of what happened at Warsaw. They were walking into this, not quite knowing what literally we were going to do to their hotel for, for the Saturday and the Friday. But they were brilliant. Unfortunately, Ellie, who who was the events manager after the event, told me she'd resigned a few weeks before. I'm thinking, oh, here we go, you know. But the new the new person who's arrived, Molly. So it's Ellie replaced by Molly, just as good. Yeah. So when we did crash, we went down there because we know Wayne, which is their Wayne. I've got my Wayne, as in Retro Robbins, and they've got a Wayne as well. They they'd learned as well from their lessons learned. And I think one of the problems we had at Zap was the the bar run dry. I don't know if you knew this. <laughs> yeah. So the bar run dry, which was a disaster for the hotel because they make a lot of their revenue from these kind of things on on the bar. But that they they resolved all of those kind of small little issues. And I think a problem we had as well at Zap was that uh, fire escapes were left open and and, and people were just ju- just randomly coming into the event. Uh, the, so we we controlled that a lot more with with Crash with the help of the hotel. And again, they they've been on to me since Crash, wanting to know what's next, basically. Literally, what's next? What are we doing next? You know, when are we doing it? Because because they had a very successful event and they they want to do more and more of that kind of thing. You know, so I've said I've already booked Crash and Zap for next year, but they would rather me come to them and do a few more things maybe in the first part of the year. We, we we've had some ideas, but whether they they follow up to reality, who knows? Yeah, but the idea of like an evening with was one thing touted. You know, if we had, for example, the psychosis team there. And then people have a meal and then there's like an after talk and chat Q&A, what presentation, you know, like, like so it's like a Q&A we're doing with Ian Oliver, for example, but it's in a, it's in that big room, but it's like you, you have a meal, you have drink, and then, you know, you're able to play some of the games from the company. And then there's like a, like a, like an after lunch talk speech, wherever, you know, that kind of thing. So, so there's that idea, whether it comes off, I don't know. The idea of maybe a computer festival or something, you know, because in this area of Kenilworth, we've got Leamington just down the road, and that's like kind of Silicon Valley, really, of, of Middle England, you know, with some of the like Codemasters and Koali and the old Blitz games and such. So there's an idea of that. But again, you know, we'll, we'll see. I'll talk to the hotel a bit more and see and see what they're they're asking me for ideas at the moment. But it'd be quite interesting to see if they've got ideas as well. You know, you, you you could have like gaming weekends or something for 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 for, for locals more than further afield. But a fusion event. The the idea the idea at some point is to do a fusion event. It won't be happening next year. Maybe the year after. I'm I'm excited to see that revival could be coming back next year with Craig. We'll see how that 
pans out but i guess a fusion event would be of, of a similar ilk really you know with arcade machines pinballs and a whole host of retro systems with, with with sinclair and and commodore fitting into that so that won't be happening now next year so it, 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 we'll see if something like that happens the year after i do remember talking i mean i mentioned difficulties it wasn't thinking of this but i do remember at one o'clock in the morning sat with you trying to get your pa system working yeah, <laughs> you're right. I'd forgotten about that as well. So you're probably wondering where I was. Where's Chris? And it was like one o'clock in the morning and I was in the Q&A room. So what we did on that Friday, we were setting up and I got a request through just from, I think it was Adam Ainsworth to say, could they watch that Micro Men documentary on the screen in there? You know, I have, a, I have a, a number of people in there. And I said, yeah, that's fine. And because I knew how the PA system was working and, and it was my laptop and how everything was interconnected, I think what I did then, because I was so busy getting other things sorted, I left them to their own devices. And then I, I guess when I got back at the end of the evening, some settings have changed. I mean, you, you know, when somebody else has done something, you, you, you don't quite know where to start. So you have to look at everything. And I can't remember how we fixed it, Jeff, but we did, didn't we? Between, I think I was talking you through what I was l- trying to do. And then we managed to fix it, didn't we? But God knows what I did. I think it was just one set. There was one small setting or one small switch we needed to flick. And yeah. I remember tracing it all through with you. Let's make sure the audio from the machine's working. Let's make sure you yeah. get audio through the speakers. Yeah. So it's basically getting the microphones to work, which we did. And then the idea was then for the, the sound coming out of the laptop, lit, wasn't it? The, the HDMI was going into the projector and then the sound was going off in, into the amplifier. And that was the bit that we were struggling with a little bit. We got it working. Yeah, I, f- I forgot about that. I forgot about that moment, Jeff. <laughs> One o'clock in the morning, thinking, "Oh my God, is this gonna, is this going to work?" I said I'd come and help set up, and obviously came along, and I was putting together those those stools for the arcade machines. Thanks for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're really hard to put together. Here's an arcade one-up stool, Jeff. Here you go, have fun. Here's a screwdriver. And then you've done it after, like, however long. And I said, oh, Jeff, here's another one to put up. The second one was much easier. I got some advice. Somebody there told me some advice. I can't remember who their name, but she was really good. And she said, yeah, don't tighten those screws until you've got this in. Yeah, otherwise they wobble. If you look at the one Wayne's did, like the one, ones Wayne did the previous um, event, they wobble because he, I think he tightened them all up as he was going along. Yeah, thanks for that as well, Jeff. I forgot about that as well. <laughs> oh no, you're welcome. I enjoyed it. I almost enjoyed coming down and setting up as much as I did the event on the day. And we must say we ra- we randomly meet up in car parks as well, don't we? Now and again. We, we do. Yeah, the, the M6 services. We're both on our way to Play Expo in Blackpool, and I just saw you. <laughs> We, we, we both decided we needed a toilet break just at the same time and then bumped into each other in a car park on the way into the services. We did. And had a discussion there. So Kenilworth is much closer to where you live. The event is much closer to where you live. I'd imagine that helped a lot, Chris. I'm trying to think back. When I, when I first moved to Kenilworth, the first event I did here was in 2005, yeah, which was literally about two or three minute walk down the road to the, the cricket club. So that was in 2005. I think we did a follow-up in 2006, which wasn't, it was more of a gathering. And then I did one in 2008, which was the Leamington Rugby Club, which is a bit further away. But we're talking about, I don't know, 100, 150 people. Then when we did Revival, Craig and I, we moved up to Wolverhampton, the Dunstall race course. And that's a good, I say 25 miles doesn't sound far, but you're you're navigating the M6 past the, the intersection with the M5, you know, which is and through spaghetti as well. So that would take hour, hour and a half each way. Craig's been doing revival up in those areas, you know, at Warsaw as well, uh, the later revivals. So it's, it's a fair trek for me. It coming back to Kenilworth that many people, I think, have only heard of since started doing these events. I timed it really from door to door with Zap and it was four minutes, a four minute drive. So if I'm in the venue and I've, let, I've forgot a cable, I can say I'll be back in 10 minutes and, you know, and, and that makes it a lot easier for me. We've got a lockup now in just outside Warwick as well. So again, learning from Zap, we, we hired a van all weekend so we could put everything back in the van. And I'm sure you helped with that as well, Jeff, didn't you? On the Saturday night? No? No. No, I didn't. I was conspicuous <laughs> by my absence. I Mike James, who I know really, really well, Mike James was there of course and he was he was dragging me off for a curry. Yeah, well, I drafted Mike in very late. I wanted him to be a part of it, and he thank- thankfully agreed because we spent a lot of time chatting at Play Expo a few weeks before. 
So he he kindly came and did the Ian Oliver Q and A, which went down really well. So yeah, so ha- having the van the weekend meant that we could put everything in the van on Saturday night after we finished the big loot. Uh, it wasn't a Luton, but it was a big van, and then I could park it up outside my house and then pop it down to the unit then on on a Monday morning. At Zap, we were still packing everything all the way through Sunday. The beauty with Crash was everybody was still there on Saturday night, whereas on Sunday, everybody, when we were finally packing things away, I think it was just predominantly me and Wayne. So we learned from that. So yeah, it, cr- Crash was quite easy, and we're still thinking of ways of, of making it easier as well, you know, where we could bring stuff to it and get stuff back into storage quite quickly. So you've you've mentioned, of course, Wayne, Wayne Robbins, who's, who, who we both know and is a great guy, and, and Mike James. I'm sure you'd like to thank them and and probably your family. Your family were helping out again. And do you want to thank any people who helped with Crash Life? Well, the, the the team the team is the team. You've got Ben Honeborn and his missus. You've got Graham Mason. You had Rich Thomas, who was not part of the team, but he came over from Sweden. A big fan of what we do, and he wanted to help. Barry Morse helped. Your good self, Wayne, others, Alan Hamilton. There, there was a whole lot of people who turned up on the Friday and were, were just helping. If they saw that something needed to be done, they, they just said, do you want any help? So from a community point of view, it was, it was absolutely brilliant. Everybody just wanted the event to be, you know, on and as good as it could be. So the problem with thanking people, Jeff, you always forget somebody, don't you? But everybody who helped, you know, knows who they are. And I look forward to them helping again with Zap and Crash next year as well, if they would be so kind. And and you've mentioned the staff at the hotel already as well. They they were really, really good. Yeah. So you go Wayne, they're Wayne. Obviously, the fa- it's, it's become a bit of a family event, as, as you said. So my wife was at the door, welcoming people in, and, and Ben's wife, Mel, with it, was there as well. You had Amber, my eldest daughter, in charge of the microphone this time, going around making announcements, and her friend Laura from... From up in Leeds, was there selling the raffle tickets. You had my son working on the Fusion Retro Books stall along with Dan, who's Amber's boyfriend. Absent this time was Sienna, who was at Zap on the microphone. She was over in Hong Kong with her boyfriend, who is over there working semi-professional, plays rugby semi-professional on one of the teams over there. So she was absent for that one. But yes, yeah, become very much a family and friends, as well as the, the core team event. Which is great, you know. One of the one of the ideas of doing Crash Live when we did the first one, I guess people didn't quite know what what to expect. They just wanted to go to an event because it had been a long time, you know, with COVID. I guess with this one, what was really pleasing was that people were using it as a platform to announce things or to launch things. The Spectrum Next being one thing, but then you had the ZX Touch as well, the little console by Syntec. You had Head Over Heels being launched and Way of the Exploding Fist and Target Renegade and lots of other games and various little things happening where where the event was the platform for that launch, which is really, really pleasing. So well, I'm hoping to hopefully there's the Zap event next year, you know, people will plan things around the event and launch things there. Now they know what the, these events are about. So I'd like to thank all of those people as well, and, and obviously all the traders who, who came and did well, and but, but sold a, a myriad of Sinclair things. You know, if you've got all these things on a table for people to buy, it's like an exhibit as well, you know? You know, Aunt Harper was there, and he had so much Spectrum stuff. It was just a pleasure to see, you know, pristine boxed Speckies, Spectrum Pluses, and various other peripherals. I mean, obviously people were buying them, but they were still there for people to see and, and appreciate, you know, that, that, that weren't necessarily there to buy these things. And all the people who exhibited, like your good selves, you know, who, who made the effort to come and, and, and help be a part of this event. And all the guests, can't forget the guests as well. You're trying to persuade people who hadn't really thought much about the spectrum for many years to come and talk about it in front of 150 odd people. It's, you know, not everybody can do that. But these guys do. They they sort of have an element of trust, and they come and 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 they they they're a huge part of what we do. Yeah, loads loads of the talks. I think the standout talk for me was Ian Oliver. I saw him and really really enjoyed his talk. And he was saying that he'd only really worked on the Spectrum for ten years of his life, and it was what 40, 30, 40 years ago. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I've tried to persuade him to come to revival events in the past. Then I tried to persuade him to come down to the Crash event last year. But because we had like the likes of Malcolm Evans and Clive Townsend and all those big names there, it helps then to persuade other people to come. 
So Ian said yes to this. So and I said to him, look, I'm a big fanboy because because you are, aren't you? You, you? Some of these games you played back in the day. I mean, Star Strike to me was was a really big deal. And so I, I spoke to him on Facebook, you know, video just to get rid of that fanboy feeling <laughs> before I actually met him. It's like, oh, my God, oh, my God, oh, my God, Ian Oliver, oh, my God, oh, my God, you know, Star Strike. <laughs> Yeah, and, and speaking of Starstrike and, and things which are happening next year, weirdly, I'm, I've been talking to Ian about buying the license off of him to create a version of Starstrike for the Spectrum next. And that's ticking along at the moment. We, we, we've a, sort of agreed the principles of the contract. But I've, all, I've, I've asked if the license could include all Z80 based games based on Starstrike going forwards. So you know, we could do the Spectrum Next version and then maybe do a version of that game for the normal Specky. And the idea is not to recreate any of the spe- the, the Star Strikes that have come before, but to create like a Star Strike 3, like like an evolution. Having having dabbled in Z80 Assembly myself... And you have, yep. That would be a big challenge. So look, looking forward, Chris, obviously we've got a date for the event next year. I think, is it the 24th of November next year or 28th? Uh, now you're asking. I, yeah, I say, I'll just say yes. It's slightly later in November than it was this year. Have you got any plans? Are there any guests you'd like to get? I haven't given it a huge amount of thought at this point. I think we had, we had a, a chat part of Facebook where everybody was chucking in many names of, of people they'd like to see. What, what I tend to do is try and find those people that developed the games that I loved back in the day. Like Star, Star Strike, for example, I, I've, I've got to know Ian over quite quite a long period of time to the point he felt comfortable coming, you know. So there would be other games that I would have played back then. And, and it's just a matter of sitting down one night and thinking, OK, how about getting whoever, this person, that person. I think we were talking about maybe some of the guys who develop games for Jurel, for example. I know we got Clive, but then there's there's all like Mike Richardson and all the other games, Scuba Dive and Combat Links and all those. And then you've got Gargoyle Games and you know various other various other companies. We we, we were blessed with Arctic for, for this event that have just gone. You know with Charles and Tony. Charles has never really done this before. He took a punt and and, and absolutely loved it. I will sit here one evening, Jeff, or maybe walk the dog, yeah, one day and think, I know. I mean, there's there's people I would love to have there, but like people from Vortex off, you know, Costa, for example. But these these people sort of disappeared or, or don't want to be found. The Stamper Brothers probably being the most famous. Yeah, and I've sort of given up with that. We, 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 Roger and I did our best to try and persuade the Stamper Brothers to do a book. You know, we sent them copies of Ocean and US Gold and such and never heard anything back. And they don't live too far away from me or you, really, do they? Sort of in the middle, in the middle between me and you, Warwickshire and up where you are creating what they call O, which stands for Ollie or wherever else you would like O to stand for. But David Sonny Clark is creating that engine and Simon Butler is doing the graphics and Paul Hesso is doing the sound the music for that so we're developing that at the moment with the idea of getting this game out but also then thinking about how could we present this game's development environment to the to the scene for example so they can come along and start thinking about creating games using this engine as well so there's that there's, there's the star strike license that i've mentioned i'm hoping to have a bit more involvement with if there is going to be a kickstarter 3 for the spectrum next if there will be one next year i'm talking to henrique and mike cadwallader in regards to that we're also talking to jason i'm talking to jason kingsley at the moment who is one of the owners of rebellion who own the rights to many licenses including houston all the games from houston but more particularly i'm talking to him about licensing drop zone and, and looking to bring that to the spectrum next as well. So, so I'm dabbling in, in in software development. I mean, my my career outside of retro was in software houses, programmer many many years ago, moving then moving into management. But that was more to do with insurance, mortgage software. So the idea of doing the, these kind of things with games after all of this time, Jeff. You know, when you try, I would love to work in the games industry but you, you sort of make you look a little bit and, and now and now i'm seeing new versions of our game o nearly every day with new features and such uh, and the idea of working with the likes of mike ware and various other people in the spectrum next team in developing games like drop zone and, and 3d star strike you know if we if we manage to secure the license of drop zone which i'm hoping we will because uh, jason is you know he, he, i think it's just getting a bit, a bit of progression on there 
the likes of getting some of the Houston titles as well, like Paradroid and Avalon, and you know, all those great games. And maybe bring in not conversions as such, but an evolution of those titles into what the second or third versions of those games could have looked like, you know, especially on new hardware. So that's one thing. And then obviously is there's the, the magazines, the books, and things start to present present themselves. I think as a crash, there was about two or three people asking me if I would publish their books. And one person even brought a, a book with them on arcade machines. You know, could, would you be interested in publishing this? Because they'd, they'd done it and got a, a single copy sort of produced. I think somebody asked me, um, well, and there's the link as well with the Retro Collective down in Stroud, from work, working with Alex and the team, more so in the, the arcade area. And I've met the guys at Hebo who own the building. I've been talking to the commercial director and, and whatever, you know, you, you talk to people, Jeff, and then you make contacts and then, you know, if opportunities arise, then it's because of the contacts you've made. I think I think during those conversations, he was asking me what my plan was and just, just to enjoy it. I, I haven't got a three-year plan. You just get inspiration along the way with the people you meet and the ideas that come to you, as I say, when walking the dog. I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm winging it, but it, it's, it's you know, something will happen in, two, in 2024, which will come sideways. And you think, yeah, that, that would be cool. And then you just run with it. And that's, that's the, the pleasure I have now and, and, and the privilege I have, I guess, in the position I'm I'm in, I guess, having the confidence to walk away from the day job, you know, and, and be able to do this a bit later on in life. It sounds wonderful, actually, Chris. You uh, make me think, I wish I'd done something like that. It's, it's never too late, mate. I was, I mean, you're younger than me, Jeff. It's having the confidence to do to walk away and, and give this a go, you know. And I feel privileged, as I said, I think the community the Spectrum and the Commodore and the, 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 the Amiga and the C64 scenes are, are sort of embracing everything we do. And I, and I don't, I, I really do not take that for granted. So it's, it's a privilege, really. I'm doing an event called Crash Live and then, you know, five, six hundred people turn up, you know. I'm doing a Zap one, five, six hundred people turn up. And I don't take any of that for granted. And we did another Crash one and <laughs> it's just, it's just a big party, really, isn't it? It's party time. A lot of hard work goes into it. I'm absolutely certain of that. Oh, uh, I just, I just want people to have a, a focal point and a good time. Uh, uh, and you know, if it, if it means I can introduce people to some of the gaming heroes for the first time, it, it's, it's just a bonus, really. I, I really, that's the aspects of this I enjoy. It's hard work, but it's, it's, it, it's so many rewards from it. It, it outweighs, you know, the hard work. I just get Wayne to carry everything anyway, you know. I noticed that. So so I started this by saying, from afar, it looks like you've had a busy 2023. It sounds like 2024 is going to be even busier for you then, Chris. Yeah, it's only as busy as I let it be, I guess. So the, the events are the second half of the year. We could easily have done probably something the first six months. We've decided not to. But in terms of other projects, yeah, I, I want to get more involved with the Retro Collective down in Stroud. And then the, the, there is many, many book ideas that I haven't even mentioned yet. They're just there. And whether you sort of have a bit of time to nurture them into something. We, we're doing a book on DOS, DOS gaming as well, which we, we said we'd, we'd do a Mastertronic book on the Spectrum. We've done collections. We've, we've, done, we've done one on the C64. There's there's a book happening as well, very similar to the Mastertronic book on Codemasters, with the idea of doing another one then thereafter on Firebird. So endless ideas. We've just got to phase things gently and because we can't just flood the market with new products because, you know, it's asking a lot of the scene then with so much stuff arriving in one go to support us. Christmas is always a big thing. It's it's The annuals seem to be a part of what we do now. The Toy Ploy annual that we've done is David Moss with from the YouTube channel has contributed to Fusion ever since we started doing it, and it's spawned off a, a complete annual on its own, which is very popular. We dropped the Zap Amiga annual for this Christmas, and there's been outcry on that. So I might start looking to create an annual in January for the Zap Amiga. And I don't think anybody's really missed the Amptix one, to be fair. Not in the UK anyway. I know there's a big fan base in, in Europe, but we, we didn't do an Amptix annual this year, and no one's really questioned it. But a lot of people have been disappointed we haven't done a Zap Amiga one. So I'll, in January, I'll look to try and sort that. Thank you, actually. I th I'll wrap up there. I was going to ask you some more, but I've taken enough of your time. Thank you, Chris. I always like talking to you. It's been great. This seems to have become an annual thing now, so maybe we'll be talking again in a year's time about what, what happens in 2024. Yeah, and I promise next year 
next year I'll definitely remember this conversation, yeah?